Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for coming. We are going to go ahead and get started, so feel free to grab a seat and we can get rolling. First of all, thank you so much for coming. This is now the fourth C++ meetup that we have done at Woven by Toyota, and we're really excited to have everyone here. I think on the first one, we had about one quarter of the attendees, and every single time it has grown and grown, and we are so thrilled to see the C++ community here growing and continuing to come out to our events. So again, thank you so much. Today, we have two wonderful guests that will be giving us a presentation, and then we will save 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. Q&A will happen right in the middle at the podium here. So anyone with a question, please save it in your head. And then at the Q&A time, feel free to come right up into the middle, line up, and you can ask your question. And we will answer to the best of our ability, hopefully. あの、日本人の方でも日本語で質問しても全然構いませんので、そのまま真ん中にあの来ていただいて、ポーディアムのマイクロフォンを取って質問をしても全然構いませんので、ぜひよろしくお願いいたします。All right. And just a couple small heads up. Today we will be filming this and posting the video on YouTube. Also, please keep uh, pictures and videos to yourself. We can't take any of those in the event, but obviously when you leave the building, you are free to take as many as you want. Other than that, we can go ahead and get started. I'd like to introduce Robert and Jessica, our two presenters today. Made it all the way to the stage without tripping anything, so that's a good start. Uh, I'm uh, Robert Secord. This is Jessica Paquette. Uh, we're going to do a uh, sort of a duet on a topic of dangerous optimizations. So, um, so for the talk today, we're going to discuss compiler optimizations. Uh, we'll start with a, a relatively simple one with constant folding, uh, then talk about adding a pointer and an integer, which was the subject of a uh, vulnerability note that uh, I wrote with Chad Doherty back in maybe 2005, and uh, give some recommendations for uh, dealing with undefined behavior and compiler optimizations in your, your own code. Um, so the premise of the talk is that uh, increasingly compiler writers are taking advantage of undefined behavior in C++ programming language to improve upon optimizations. So frequently these optimizations can interfere with the ability of developers to perform cause-effect analysis on their source code. And that's not just developers, that also goes to uh, uh, static analysis tools. Uh, because when you're developing a stack analysis tool, you could, say, target GCC and try to keep up with the optimizations they apply and determine which kind of, uh, you know, undefined behavior they might uh, optimize on and diagnose that. Uh, but um, then you've limited your market to just developers who are using that compiler. So source code analysis tools tend to uh, work in general. And so now they have to make a decision. Do we uh, diagnose a potential undefined behavior uh, uh, and risk the possibility of a, a false positive if that's not optimized or uh, ignore it and risk the possibility of a false negative if it is optimized? So, um, so for both, developers and for tools, um, there's, there's, a, there, there's an increasing inability to analyze the code that can result in um, downstream failures, uh, vulnerabilities, and defects. So uh, discussed undefined behavior, uh, at least mentioned undefined behavior. Um, 
Undefined, uh, there, are, there are a couple hundred undefined behaviors in C and many more added by uh, C++. And when a compiler implementation encounters undefined behavior in your code, uh, it can ignore that uh, completely with unpredictable results. Uh, in C, uh, we tend to say things like uh, the computer's free to go off and play the game of life because everyone in the C community is really, really old. And back in the 70s, you know, the game of life was like, like a cool computer application. Uh, in C++, they're more likely to say something like nasal demons will fly out your nose. Uh, so that's the, that's the younger generation for you. Um, so the other possibility with UB is a compiler could behave in a documented manner, characteristic of the environment with or without a diagnostic. But that's not always great. Uh, something like uh, int min, remainder minus one would character, characteristically trap on a uh, Intel processor. And so uh, while that's characteristic behavior, you know, your program crashing might not be uh, what you're looking for. Uh, and then finally, uh, the compiler could terminate the translation or execution with the diagnostic. That's really the best, best case you could ask for. Um, Compiler optimizations for C++ compilers are really uh, the same as for optimizers for any other procedural programming language. The fundamental principle is that you replace a computation with a more efficient method that uh, computes the same result. So, uh, and this is, this is sort of a, a dumb observation, but uh, these optimizations can alter the, the behavior of the program, particularly in the presence of uh, undefined behavior. And so the uh, optimizations that eliminate undefined behaviors are, are good, and then they're the ones that might introduce vulnerabilities, so those are, those are the bad ones. So C++ has something called the as-if rule, where the semantics of the program are defined on an abstract machine, uh, but compilers are allowed to um, uh, are allowed to use whatever methods they want, provided they get the the results required by the abstract machine. So this gives compilers the leeway to remove code that's deemed unused or unneeded when building a program, uh, and and typically this is beneficial. Um, but uh, sometimes it removes code that's been added, um, uh, you know, with, uh, with security, particularly with security in mind, because um, a lot of vulnerabilities are undefined behaviors, and in testing for undefined behavior, it's very easy to, to invoke undefined behavior. Uh, so quite frequently, your, your test uh, might be removed by the, uh, by the compiler. So compiler writers uh, have uh, one of three different implementation strategies. Uh, the first is the hardware behavior model, where the compiler generates the corresponding assembly code uh, corresponding to your source code, and then just lets the hardware do whatever the hardware does. And for many years, this was the uh, universal policy. So uh, many uh, experienced C++ programmers have internalized uh, this hardware behavior model. There is a super debug model where the uh, to provide an intensive debugging environment where you trap uh, nearly all uh, undefined behaviors. And uh, this is useful for development and testing, but it severely degrades performance. And so it's seldom used for building, uh, for deploying uh, applications. And finally, there's the total license model. Uh, where, where the compiler can treat any undefined behavior as a can't happen condition, and that permits uh, aggressive optimization. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jessica to talk about constant folding. Okay, so now we know a little bit about compilers, we know a little bit about optimizations, and we know a little bit about undefined behavior. The title of this talk is Dangerous Optimizations, so let's talk about one such dangerous optimization called constant folding. So the question I would like to ask you is, how might you 
hand optimize some of this code. Okay, so the first thing I would like you to notice is the variable CST at the top. It's equal to a simple constant 17. So what we can do is we can replace all instances of this variable with the actual value 17. From there, we might notice that this other variable z uh, can now actually be simplified in a similar way. At the end of this, we've simplified the code to the point where we've actually removed an entire variable, and we've also managed to get rid of a subtraction. Optimizing compilers will actually automatically optimize constant expressions like this for you. Uh, this op optimization happens at least once at all optimization levels. Even in unoptimized debug builds, optimizing C++ compilers will perform constant folding for you. There are a couple of reasons for this. Firstly, Language features may require certain optimizations to function properly or function in a usable way. So the compiler for a language may need to guarantee things like constant folding on certain language constructs. Secondly, unoptimized build usually means debug build to compiler engineers such as myself. Debug builds need to produce binaries that are fast enough to actually run, or they're not very useful as debug builds in the first place, and they need to be small enough to actually execute in the environment that they're going to execute in. You could be working on an embedded system, for example, in a very small microcontroller. If the binary is too large to fit in the constrained environment, then it's not very useful for debugging. So now I'd like to ask you a question. What does I evaluate to in this expression? Let's compile this code with GCC and with Clang. And then we're gonna see what happens. With and without optimizations, GCC actually constant folds this expression to zero. Uh, this is what most people probably expect. Uh, something to note here, though, is that this code actually contains undefined behavior. Clang takes advantage of this undefined behavior and optimizes out the entire computation of i. The call to printf isn't eliminated, so it just gets whatever is in the input register, and this results in just a garbage value. Now, both of these results are correct because the code does contain undefined behavior. I've included a link to Compiler Explorer that you can follow if you want after this talk. Um, if you do decide to play around with it, I recommend adding the f sanitize equals undefined flag to the compiler options in the link and see what happens. Another valid way to compile this is to recognize that there's undefined behavior at compile time and then just not compile it at all. Um, recent MSVCs do this. Older versions don't. But this is valid too. As before, here's a Compiler Explorer link that you can visit to see this in more detail. The main takeaway here is that you have to be really, really, really careful. Different compilers may produce different results on UB, undefined behavior, and even if you have a wonderful test suite that has full coverage, it might actually not be able to account for what the compiler might do to your code if it contains UB. So now I'm going to hand it back to Robert to tell you a little bit about pointer arithmetic. Thank you. Um, okay, so pointer arithmetic. So in uh, C++, uh, you can form a pointer to each element of the array, 
And additionally, you can form a pointer to what's called the too far array, uh, too far uh, element, which is uh, the, the next element off the end of the array. So each of those pointers you're allowed to dereference, uh, except for the too far pointer. So dereferencing the too far pointer results in undefined behavior. And forming a pointer that's beyond the too far pointer is also undefined behavior. Now, if the, uh, if the addition uh, uh, overflows and wraps around, that's also considered uh, undefined behavior. And this particular undefined behavior is different than either floating point overflow or signed integer overflow. It's a third kind of overflow. So quickly back to Jessica with the pop quiz. Oh boy, pop quizzes, my favorite kinds of quizzes. Okay, so super fun C++ pointer arithmetic quiz number one. We've got an integral type and we've got a pointer type and we're adding the pointer and the integer together. What type is the result? Robert, what do you think the result is? I really have no idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, the result of adding an integral type to a pointer type or subtracting an integral type from a pointer type is the pointer type in C++. All right. Super fun C++ pointer arithmetic quiz number two. In C++ specifically, not C, what is the value of res equal to? We've got an integral type equal to zero, and we've got a null pointer. So, Robert, in C++ specifically, what do you think this is equal to? So, I'm more of a C programmer, so I would think it would be UB. Well, you would be wrong. It's actually very defined in C++. Uh, for addition in C++, the result is always going to be null in this case. Uh, for subtraction, if we're subtracting zero from a null pointer, the result is null. If we're adding any value other than zero to null, then we get UB. This null and zero behavior holds for all pointer types in C++. It could be a pointer to an integer. It could be a pointer to a struct. It could be a pointer to an array, whatever. As long as it's null, we know for certain that if we add zero to it or subtract zero from it, the result is always defined to be null. The reason for this is that we get some improved optimizations and more user-friendly behavior in general for library implementers. If you'd like to explore this more, please check out the Compiler Explorer link on the slide after this talk. Okay. Super fun C++ pointer arithmetic quiz number three. We've got an array with, say, five elements. We've got an integral type. We've got a pointer into the array, and we want to add an integer to the pointer. So the question is, is what does the result point to? So, Robert, what do you think the result points to? I think it could point anywhere. Okay. Well, you could be right. It really depends on whether or not the result of j plus the, point, uh, j plus the pointer is within the range of zero and the too far element. Otherwise, it could be anywhere. Um, it could be removed by the compiler. It could introduce a trap. It's undefined. This also holds for subtraction. Uh, if you're in the bounds, then you get the array element. If you're out of the bounds, then the result is undefined. So now it's back to Robert to tell you a little bit about bounds checking. Thank you, Jessica. So uh, when, you're, when you're writing code as a programmer, you might uh, decide that you know, buffer overflows are a bad idea because you know uh, various headlines you've read in the news about people getting totally owned. So uh, as a result, you might decide it's a good idea to uh, write a, bound, uh, a bounds check for your code to avoid uh, buffer overflows. 
So typically, you would have a pointer which points to the start of an array. You would have another pointer, max in this case, that points to the last element in the array. Uh, and then you might have a size. And that size might originate from an untrusted uh, source. So it might be a tainted value. Uh, and now you want to uh, test to make sure that uh, after you add that length to pointer, that it's still within the bounds of the array. So you'll test to see whether pointer plus len is greater than max. That would indicate uh, an erroneous uh, length. So the problem with this code is regardless of which model uh, you're assuming, the hardware behavior model or the total license model, uh, there's a bug in this code. And the bug is that for very large values of len, uh, pointer plus len can overflow. And this is the overflow we discussed a few slides ago uh, where the value could potentially wrap around. And as we saw, that's uh, undefined behavior. So under the hardware behavior model, typically the result of that uh, overflow would wrap around. And you'd wind up with an address that's actually lower in memory than pointer. So as a result, uh, an experienced um, developer uh, who's really internalized this hardware behavior model of undefined behavior might uh, expand the check and add an additional um, um, sub-expression that uh, tested if pointer plus len was less than pointer. So that would be there to test for this, um, for tests for possible overflow. So the problem with this uh, repair is that um, overflow is undefined. And so this allows the compiler to assume pointer overflow won't occur. Consequently, this additional subcondition is uh, unused or unnecessary. Uh, back to you, yeah. Jessica. So we're going to pretend for a moment that I'm that experienced programmer that Robert was talking about. And we're going to see how my repair attempt does against the total license model. OK. So remember that the total license model means that the compiler can assume that any expression containing undefined behavior does not happen. So let's look at our check. When is the first part of our check going to be true? If it's true, then adding the length to the pointer must have produced a smaller result than what we had before in the pointer. That means that we must have overflowed, which is great because that's what we wanted to prevent, right? We wanted to see if adding the length to the pointer wraps around, right? But whatever, whenever this happens on a signed addition, this is, this is overflow. This is signed overflow, which is UB. This is UB and C++, which means that, well, we're in the total license model, right? And the total license model says that this can't happen. So this can't, like, the, because it can't ever happen, this means that this is never true. Oh, but okay, well, it's never true, which means that this is dead code, which means that the compiler can come along and it's allowed to delete it. Oh, well, that's just horrible. The compiler comes along and it helpfully comes in and it deletes some dead code for us which just happens to be the important part of that bounce check that we just added. So this is one of the reasons why it's important to avoid writing undefined behavior in your code. In one compiler version, this check might not be removed. That's allowed. Um, but you might update your compiler or change compiler vendors and then start seeing different unexpected behavior. Um, the only way to avoid this is to avoid writing code that is undefined in general. Now I'm going to give it back to Robert to give you a different perspective on this exact problem.
Thanks, Jessica. So we're going to look at this uh, from the, the, the optimization that's being performed. Uh, and it's a, it's a very common optimization. It's basically algebraic simplification, right? Which uh, we all learned to do in, in middle school when we first learned algebra. And it seems like quite a reasonable thing. So optimizations can be performed for comparisons between the same pointer p and an integer value p1 and that same pointer p and another integer value v2. So the total license model permits this to be reduced to a comparison between the two integer values v1 and v2. But if v1 and v2 are such that the sum with p overflows, then the comparison of v1 and v2 uh, will not yield the same result as actually performing the addition and comparing the sums. So the interesting thing here is that computer arithmetic doesn't always obey the algebraic identities of mathematics. So there's a lot of you know, assumptions that programmers have from learning math in uh, you know, primary school that don't always apply uh, when you're dealing with a, you know, a, fi a finite model of, of, of integers. So if we look back on uh, our bounds check example, uh, you'll see again we have the pointer plus len less than pointer sub expression. So we'll pull that out and we'll add a zero to the right hand side. This is of course an allowed transformation because you're not uh, changing anything by adding, adding zero. Uh, but now when you look at the uh, you look at the expression, it has the form p plus v1 compared to p, p plus v2. So using algebraic simplification, this can be reduced to a comparison between uh, v1 and v2. And once you do that, now you have len less than zero. And this is impossible because len is unsigned. It can't be less than zero. So therefore, uh, this expression is, is meaningless and it can be removed from your code. So from this perspective, it seems like a quite reasonable transformation to make. Uh, but again, what we've seen is that it's defeated uh, our, our bounds check. So the mitigation for this is quite straightforward. The, the difficulty is really in identifying the problem because uh, this actual defect was reported to CERT by uh, Plan 9 developers at Bell Labs. And so, uh, you know, those, those, those developers are really good. <laughs> so these are not novice, uh, novice programmers. Uh, so uh, again, in our example, assuming pointers less than or equal to max, which we know because we set a uh, pointer to the uh, beginning of the array and we set max to the last element of the array, uh, the programmer can rewrite that uh, expression uh, as len greater than max minus pointer. Right? So now max minus pointer cannot wrap around. That'll produce a reasonable value. And this expression cannot be optimized away. So this is the, the correct way to write that, uh, that test for overflow. And uh, in writing it this way, uh, you eliminate uh, undefined behavior, and you eliminate the, uh, the possibility of, of uh, that undefined behavior being optimized away. So summary and recommendations. Uh, it's best to avoid undefined behaviors in your code. Uh, even if your code appears to be working for the time being, it is, it is possible, undefined behavior is, is actually a, a, a portability issue. So it is possible to have undefined behavior in your source code and have a correct executable. But the issue is that the compiler might change and suddenly that behavior will change and now your executable will uh, no longer be correct. Uh, so it is best to, to find and, and eliminate uh, UB from your code. Um, 
so so the one of the things you can do with dead code is is you know look for when the compiler is eliminating it uh, and uh, just uh, just rewrite your code yourself right so it's typically a bad idea to uh, rely on the compiler to to optimize your code to a correct form right so you want to make sure your your code is correct even without optimizations. Um, so some optimizations can eliminate undefined behaviors while others might introduce vulnerabilities. Uh, overall, it really does make sense to optimize your code, right? So go ahead and compile it O2 and O3 for your, uh, your production builds. Um, O2, I think you use for more uh, typical code because it can ex uh, O3 can expand the size but if you've got uh, hot spots in your code, it might make sense to use O3 and deal with a small increase in, in uh, the code size, but get greater uh, you know, runtime performance from small parts of code. Um, there was a strict overflow flag that you could use to detect, uh, that would diagnose uh, these um, optimizations based on overflow. Uh, however, GCC, deprecated this check in version 8.0, and Clang uh, never implemented it to begin with, so in Clang, this flag had always been a, uh, a no-op. So the flag is really now busted. The documentation doesn't say that, but uh, you should probably avoid using it uh, now because it's, it's got some problems. And uh, the preferred way, the recommended way now to detect these problems is using fsanitize um, signed integer overflow, uh, which, is a, which is a dynamic analysis flag. So you can instrument your code using this flag, but then you have to exercise it using fuzz testing or uh, your normal uh, testing routine in order to exercise the code and trigger uh, defects uh, resulting from uh, this behavior. So that's all we have. Um, uh, Jessica and I both thank you for coming and we're ready to answer your questions. Robert and Jessica, thank you so much for the presentation. If anyone has questions, now is the time. I know it's always hard and embarrassing to be the first, so please hop up and grab the mic and ask away. Hi. So I'd like to hear from you. Uh, what's your most favorite and least favorite undefined behavior? Uh, my favorite's like the uh, empty C program. <laughs> Just like, if you've just got like nothing, anything could happen. And yeah, it's just strange. What about you, Robert? Um, so my, my favorite and least favorite, uh, JFB has a, has a really good YouTube video on this so you can find it and, and watch it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, my, 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 I don't know, my favorite UB is Probably, um, probably the one we were discussing with the int min minus one because uh, int min remainder minus one because uh, a lot of people aren't familiar with it. You know, I was speaking to a uh, defense contractor in the U.S. who wrote you know software for jet fighters, and I said, "Oh, division can overflow." He's like, "Yes, yes, I know." And and then I said. Uh, oh, and uh, remainder can overflow. And he's like, what? And I explained how, and his face went white, and he ran out of the room. So I'm not exactly sure what that was about, but it was, it was entertaining. I think my least favorite UB is the UB uh, in infinite loops, uh, because I have to write a paper about that. So it's going to be my least favorite right now, because it's creating work for me. <laughs> Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, I'm currently working on a blog post about a certain kind of UB by chance. Um, this is the case where 
you are converting a floating point uh, value to an integral value, and after truncation, the value does not fit in the destination type, um, which usually redounds to some sort of overflow. Um, but uh, at the end of my blog post, I have like a, like a takeaway as a recommendation section, and the first thing that I say is you should use uh, UBSAN because I would have never known about this uh, behavior in my program if I didn't have UBSAN on. So I was wondering if there is a reason that you didn't uh, recommend UBSAN in this presentation. So the, the flag that we mentioned is actually a flag to UBSAN. So we, we sort of mentioned it implicitly. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, agreed that um, all the sanitizers, address sanitizer, thread sanitizer, UB sand sanitizer, they're all really effective tools. Uh, I would say particularly for thread safety and for memory issues because static analysis tends to be weaker at finding those type of issues and dynamic analysis tends to be stronger. Yeah. In my opinion, I strongly recommend UB sand. So um, I think that the thing is, is we want it, uh, it's a, it's a, deep topic and we wanted to make sure that whatever we cover, we cover deeply and we didn't really have a lot of time to talk about UBSAN versus how is the compiler going to destroy your code and, you know, sell that to people. So that was the main reason. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's cool. I want to make sure the people know to turn on UBSAN. Yes, I think please it's turn on UBSAN. Turn on UBSAN. Everybody in this room, turn on UBSAN. <laughs> Thank you. Hello? Okay. You hear me? Okay. Um, I was just wondering, are these un undefined behaviors that you talk about, are they something that you experience at Wuben in, in real life? They're things you experience when you work in C and C++ because they're just part of the game. Like, right. That's... Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, you could enforce pretty strict rules, so... At my former company, we used, uh, it's called MISRA or M-I-S-R-A. Mm -hmm. So you have this static analysis tool that goes, it was called the PC Lint, I think. And I mean, it's tough to, 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 to enforce that kind of code, especially if you follow all the rules. But I think the, one, the examples mentioned here, I, it should have ca caught all of those, I think. Well, so, so we, we do use you know, Misra, um, you know, uh, C++ 2023, and we use AutoZar yeah. 1903. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 you know, those standards have rules against undefined behavior, but undefined behavior uh, is, is undefined because it's not always detectable. Yeah. And, you know, there are, there are proofs for the halting problem that you can't, uh, necessarily prove that a program is going to terminate. Uh, so there are proofs that undefined behavior are, are uh, sometimes un, un, undetectable. Uh, yes. So, you know, having writing code that's free from UB is, um, really involves uh, many stages, right? And the first stage is education, teaching people uh, about these different issues, how to code securely. Uh, second stage is, uh, you know, writing code that conforms to uh, MISRA, other, and also we apply the co uh, CERT coding standards, which I highly recommend having, you know, written those. And, uh, and um, you know, then you have to apply uh, analysis, static analysis. We talked about UBSAN, other dynamic analysis. You have to have rigorous testing. Mm. Uh, and then, um, yeah, and then you know, hopefully um, you've, uh, you've got uh, code that's free from UB and, uh, you know. But the, pr the problem with dynamic analysis, for example, add adding sanitizer and so on, it's that, I mean, it only catches it when it right. occurs, right? So, I mean, if you have a rigorous unit test or functional test at a higher level, or even target tests, uh, I mean, you, you could catch them, but you could also not catch them. So, right. I mean, Every, everything's inadequate. I mean, static yeah. analysis is inadequate. Very, you know, very little static analysis is sound and complete. Yeah. And this, the, the analysis that is sound and complete is generally useless. Yeah. The, the heuristic uh, analysis is usually, 
more, more useful. Uh, dynamic analysis, you have to trigger it during testing. Um, you know, doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. You should do it. You should use fuzz testing with it. And testing, of course, is incomplete, right? You can't possibly test all, all code paths. So this is why it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a software engineering discipline, right? You right. have to be, take a disciplined approach from your requirements through to your deployment. Yes. Uh, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, but, but anyway, I can just highly recommend doing misread checks like in the, in the release chain, or I guess you have that kind of release chain where you do these unit tests or whatever, but it's, it's proprietary, I think, but it's cheap, really. So. I mean, oh yeah, no, we we're uh, I'm on the Misra committee. We have okay. Andreas is on the Misra committee. Uh, so yeah. we get together every other Friday and scream at each other for a couple hours. So yeah, it's quite <laughs> right. quite fun. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, it sounds like you know what you're doing far more than I am, and I haven't touched this stuff in a few years. So. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, get on my get on Amazon and write that in my under my book. Say, Robert <laughs> Robert Secord seems to know what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Picking on uh, on the previous questions, so we have analysis tools that can help us detect uh, undefined behavior in our code and fix them. Are there any specific patterns or specific paths of undefined behavior that I have to look out for that the analysis tools that we have may not catch? So ones that I specifically have to look out for because the analysis tools are not complete enough at, or there's something like a, the halting problem or some other problem that prevents analysis tools from catching them. Yeah, and any type of data flow analysis is maybe not going to be detected. Uh, all compilers, all analysis tools have to complete within a certain amount of time, right? And so uh, they'll, they'll investigate to some level of, say, nesting, right? And uh, we, had, we had the Heartbleed vulnerability not too long ago. That code had been analyzed with um, Coverity, and it turned out that uh, the, the, the defect was nested like a few levels below their their uh, the depth they looked at nesting, and so afterwards they revised their tool to look a few levels deeper, uh, and and eventually were able to discover uh, that defect. But um, yeah, so there's uh, and that you know so that that leads to a lot of things, even uninitialized reads, right? Um, the the difficulty is determining, you know. Is there a path upon which this this um, object is read before it's been written, uh, and that can require extensive path analysis that's not always successful? Have an answer. I think that's pretty much yeah. Like yeah, it, it's unfortunate basically. Like it's like you can't. I, I don't. I can't think of any specific patterns that you need to look for because if you could easily look for it. It'd probably already be in the tools, right? So, um, yeah, I don't have a great answer for that. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> well, well, thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, I have the, well, we have the fortunate, we are fortunate enough to have Robert here who knows a lot about C and, and, and Jesse knows about C. And I sometimes have to work with C, and mm -hmm. my opinion is a bit unfortunate. <laughs> and I, have to invoke things like undefined behavior, like const cast stuff, because C doesn't know about const. Is there a chance that the C++ compiler will break my C compatibility layer because I have to do, because I have to bridge between the two languages? So, I'm not sure I follow why you have to have U, B, and C. I think well, it's typically possible would, to avoid. Yeah. Typically, I would, I would pass, I have a const pointer, I have to const cast it to non-const because a C interface cannot take a const something. Yeah, that's okay in C. Um, so in C, you can have a, um, you can have a non-const object, uh, you can pass it through a const pointer, you can, you can 
convert it back to a non-const and you can write it. And that's not UB. It's actually only UB if it's a const object to begin with. So it's, it's the writing of a const object that's UB, but everything else is, is okay. Thank you. Hi, um, I was just curious, are there, aside from um, optimization opportunities and uh, I guess just implementation difficulties in terms of it's being impossible to, sorry, uh, implementation dif difficulties because it's impossible sometimes or very hard to uh, detect. Are, are there any other reasons beyond those two why the standard defines so many different things to be UV? Um, and related to that, I, like the, the right at the start, you had an example with constant division and you, uh, you had a point that MSVC had introduced a diagnostic. Um, I was just wondering if there, if there are things that the standard declares to be UB and there's not really any good reason why they should be declared that way and yeah. they could be diagnosed. So, so there, there are three reasons why uh, things might be defined as UB. Uh, so the first is it's difficult to diagnose. And difficult to diagnose is kind of weird, right? Because uh, we might have a discussion in committee and, and we'll say, uh, you know, uh, does anyone have a problem diagnosing this? And uh, Fred will say, oh, that's easy to diagnose. And Bill will say, oh, yeah, no problem. And, and Sally will say, yeah, we can do that. And Fred will say, oh, no, we, we can't diagnose that because of our compiler design. And uh, everyone else will say, okay, Fred, don't worry about it. We'll make it undefined behavior and you don't have to diagnose it. Now, the other compilers will still diagnose that, but Fred's compiler uh, won't, so it's categorized as UB. Uh, everyone in the committees are very cordial to each other uh, because it's not, a, it's not very competitive. They're, they're really collaborating, uh, you know, to develop infrastructure. Um, Isn't, that implementa Sorry. Isn't that what implementation-defined behavior is kind of to allow for, and that you can you, can, you make the implementation define what it will do. Yeah. Um, well, in this case, the problem is, is the undetectability of the issue. On certain files. Yeah. So I don't think, you know, implementation defined behavior, uh, the, the behavior, the, the implementation has to document how it handles that, right? So. The, the width of, uh, the size of integers is implementation defined. Each implementation defines the sizes. But in a, in a case where it can't be detected, they can't guarantee any behavior. They can't even identify the problem. So that's one reason. Uh, and, and then, you know, some like the halting problem, that's, that's undetectable by everyone. Uh, the second reason is when you have sort of obscure corner cases on hardware, uh, where um, uh, the, uh, you know, the compilers want to, uh, they don't want to require a particular behavior which is going to make certain processors, certain implementations slower. Uh, and so some examples of this include, um, include int min remainder minus one uh, on an Intel processor that will fault uh, on other processors, you might be able to produce a zero value. It faults on Intel because it uses a div instruction, and the result of int min uh, divided by minus one is not representable in a two's complement representation. So other examples include um, like shift operations. So if you shift more than 32 bits, or you, or sorry, if you shift more bits than you have in your promoted uh, right-hand operator. Uh, it's undefined because it's a meaningless operation and different processors produce a different result. And so, uh, and the same is true of a negative shift. It's a, it's a, it's a meaningless operation uh, and different processors produce a different result. Now, if the standard were to say you have to produce this result, now the implementations would have to be slower to emulate a particular result for a, a nonsensical operation. And so C and C++ uh, are meant, 
are designed to be optimally efficient, and so uh, they they basically let the hardware do what the hardware does, and you as the the, the programmer have to be aware of those edge cases on your particular architectures and make sure that you don't trigger them. So the burden kind of gets shifted. I mean, the other option is you can be Java, define the behavior, just you know, run slow everywhere. Uh, but that's, that's why we don't use Java. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for the great talk. And so you mostly mentioned about the undefined behavior of the C and C++. And there, I'm curious, I think we, there, you know, LVM IR also has their undefined behavior. So I'm curious how we are filling the gap between the front end language undefined behavior and the undefined behavior of the middle end language, you know, like IR. So that we like how you, what happens when you have something that appears undef in LVM IR, for example? Yeah. Um, so I'm not familiar with everywhere that this shows up in LVM, but um, sometimes things will appear when you're doing like instruction selection, for example, with undef in LVM. So you're doing instruction selection and then you have um, a register that's feeding into something. And the register, it's like, oh, that, that could be anything. And then you'll have something like a shift with an undef or whatever. And then the optimizer is allowed to, well, not the optimizer, it's the selector. The selector is allowed to, you know, potentially choose a value for some of these things. So you can end up with like, you know, what appears to be UB uh, throughout LVM. Um, another way that it can show up is if there is something that is marked as undefined in the middle end, uh, that might actually kind of propagate through the code and be marked as poison. And that might cause other things to get deleted, like in a larger range. Um, I wouldn't say that like, mm, yeah, like that, that's kind of the difference between like the middle ends UB and like, you know, when we're talking about like C and C++ specifically, I think, if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think Rust also has different set of undefined behavior, yeah. for example, like there, in Rust, I think infinite loops are allowed in Rust, but I think C++ doesn't allow infinite loops. So in that case, LLVM has to capture both semantics. And there, you know, for Rust, we have to generate the parity code for infinite loops, where there for C and C++, you know, we can do everything because it's undefined. So mm -hmm. I'm curious how to uh, fill the gap between the... Uh, oh, so like, what do you mean by the gap? Like, like what, what do you mean by the gap between the two? Like, yeah, because uh, in yeah, because one in one language, uh, infinite loops allowed, and in one language, you know, infinite loop is not allowed. In right. that case, the LVM has to allow both, or maybe the LVM IR has to allow. Uh, if we loop for one and not for others, so there, I think there is some gap between the these two. Oh, I, I think the thing is, is like whatever you feed, like the front end can control what it feeds into mm -hmm. LVM. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have like you know Rust C, for example, go and generate some code that you know will be optimized in a certain way, like hey, this is UB now or whatever, and we're gonna write a bunch of undefs everywhere and a bunch of poison. Oh, I should just talk to um, If you want to do that, you can make the front end compiler admit that. Um, it's not really something that LLVM needs to know about. Like the point of LLVM is that it's not supposed to know about the front end, mm -hmm. right? Like that's why you end up with like languages like Swift, for example. Mm -hmm. Swift actually has its own IR that is designed to capture Swifty things, and then that gets lowered to the correct LVM IR, which is then handled by LVM. So I don't think that there's really like a gap for LVM to mm -hmm. bridge here, sure. if that makes sense. Yeah, okay, thanks. All right, thank you everybody so much. Those were wonderful questions, and thank you again for coming up and asking them. I know it's not easy to stand up in front of everyone and do it, but thank you, we really appreciate it. 
Um, we're going to switch into the networking part of this session now. So we'll have about an hour roughly to just chat with each other. If you have any lingering questions, feel free to come up and talk to any of us. Not me, but everybody else. And it should be uh, pretty cool. So I just want to give a big thank you. Robert, Jessica, thank you so much for being here, presenting. It was awesome. <laughs>